Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is writer, director, producer, and actor, Elamaya Tailfeathers. Elamaya is a member of the Kainai First Nation, as well as Sami from Norway. Her latest film is Gima B. Pitsen, The Meaning of Empathy, an intimate portrait of her community and the impacts of the substance abuse and overdose epidemic. Elamaya, thanks so much for being with us on the show this week. I had a chance to watch the film this week. It's uh, very powerful and eye-opening. Why was this a film that you wanted to make? Uh, well, thank you for thank you for your kind words. Um, my mother is uh, one of the few medical doctors on the reserve, and uh, fentanyl hit our community in 2014. Um, so I was hearing. So many stories from her, what she was, what she was witnessing on the front lines, um, the fact that we had lost so many members in such a short period of time within our community. Uh, all of that just just made me feel very compelled to to tell this story. I had also seen um, so many misrepresentations of our community in in the media um, that were often framed through uh, poverty porn or trauma porn lens. Um, and what was sort of sensationalizing the, the crisis through a lens of tragedy, um, rather than showing the strength of my community and all of the hard work that was happening on the front lines. So it was really important for me to, to counter those narratives and um, show the community that I know and love uh, and, and showcase all of the hard work that was happening and continues to happen in the community. You were clearly working on uh, Gima B. Pitson for quite some time. Why was it uh, now that you wanted to release it? Uh, well, it was five years in the making, um, and uh, the pandemic definitely slowed us down. We were supposed to be finished about a year ago, um, but I think the timing was just right. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. um, in British Columbia and Alberta alone, uh, over 2,000 people have, have died from drug poisoning or, or from overdoses uh, since this pandemic started, and all of those deaths are preventable. Yeah, the prairies, uh, the numbers are no better there. Um, you mentioned that things really started happening in Kainai in, in June of 2014. Do you know what, what happened, what changed? Uh, well. There were a lot of things that, that changed that I think we saw everywhere, which was that um, the OxyContin supply uh, changed uh, or was limited or cut off, and fentanyl, uh, a synthetic opi opioid, was introduced to the community um, without people's knowledge. They didn't realize that what they were what they were ingesting was, was fentanyl and not OxyContin, and uh, that has resulted in seven years of uh, of this opioid crisis within our community. As you mentioned in the film, not one family in the community has not been impacted by this crisis. What has that done and, and meant for the nation? Uh, well, the grief is, is overwhelming. I mean, every single person has lost a loved one uh, in the last seven years, if not many loved ones, to this crisis. Um, and so, there's the grief that needs to be acknowledged and those lives that have been lost that need to be honored. Um, but it's also been a catalyst for, for change um, and for trying radical solutions or alternative solutions to, to addiction that um, haven't necessarily been widely accepted within Indigenous communities before this crisis. So our community of Kainai has become uh, a national leader in, in um, addressing the opioid crisis in particular uh, in implementing really radical solutions in terms of harm reduction. Yeah, can you talk a bit about uh, those solutions? Yeah, sure. So uh, in regards to, to treating addiction, there are two uh, sort of mainstreams uh, that, that, are, that are approached in terms of, of treating addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is, is abstinence-based uh, treatment, which 
most of us are, are very familiar with, and it's kind of like the most widely accepted form of treating addiction. Um, so abstinence asks that, that people who are using drugs or alcohol abstain or quit cold turkey. Um, and programs like 12 Step, programs like AA, NA, the Red Road to Wellbriety often implement uh, abstinence-based approaches to, to treating addiction. Um, the other the other way of approaching addiction is through harm reduction. Um, and harm reduction is rooted in the idea of, of meeting drug and alcohol users where they are at. And so uh, it doesn't expect people to quit cold turkey. Um, it understands that asking people to, to completely abstain is sometimes a, a very inhumane or unrealistic expectation. Um, so harm reduction uh, can mean uh, policies, strategies, and procedures like providing clean needles to prevent the spread of disease or um, implementing opioid agonist therapy, which is like Suboxone or Methadone, um, or even implementing safe, uh, stable housing for people who, who are without homes. Um, so recognizing housing as harm reduction. Mm -hmm. um, and so within our community, um, there were a number of things that were implemented. One was providing naloxone or Narcan to, to lay people, just to community members, in an effort to save lives. Naloxone is the antidote to, uh, to an opioid overdose. Um, and that, that saw very immediate change within our community. Um, another thing that was implemented was, was opioid agonist therapy or Suboxone. Um, hundreds of people in our community have, have um, gone through the, the process of recovery with the support of, of Suboxone. Um, we also implemented uh, a, super, a, a safe withdrawal site or a detox. Um, so in, in Canada, uh, healthcare is, is under provincial jurisdiction, but as we all know, on reserve, healthcare is under federal jurisdiction. Um, and so that's why we often don't see hospitals or detoxes on reserve because those are uh, conventionally, provincially funded. And so our community um, fought for a detox on reserve. And so now we have a detox um, that has seen so many members of our tribe go through those doors. And there's been a lot of successful um, stories come out of that, out of that detox. Um, there's also aftercare that's been implemented. Um, and so a lot of, of gaps have been addressed and, and, and continue to be addressed. And I'm just so proud of all of the hard work that's happening on the front lines and all of the people who are working tirelessly behind the scenes to find to find solutions and and to do it in very unconventional ways. On the surface, the doc, you know, can seem as though it's a, it's about addiction, but it's also about treaty and government policies, racism in the healthcare system, and racism in the communities that are nearby the First Nation. Can you talk about how all those are kind of intertwined? Yeah, sure. Um, well, for me, it was it was so critical, especially for settler audiences, to understand that there is a connecting line from everything that's happened to our people because of settler colonialism and and the ongoing impacts of settler colonialism to this current addictions crisis that we are witnessing. Um, I think. You know, my community is in southern Alberta, and the province of Alberta is very conservative, and the racism that we see on the prairies is so explicit. Um, and so I wanted settler audiences, especially in the prairies, to understand that there is a connecting line between everything that's happened to our people and what we what we see today with, with the, um, the substance use crisis. Um, and I thought it was also really important to humanize uh, the people who are using drugs and alcohol, um, the people who are who are living with this crisis on a, on a daily basis. I want I wanted people to have compassion and understanding um, and to understand that drug and alcohol users deserve to be treated with dignity and, and respect um, and that their voices need to be centered in this conversation. Yeah, well, the English title of the, the documentary, The Meaning of Empathy, is that what you're hoping viewers will take away empathy for those who they may just see as people with addictions issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Gimabi Bitsen uh, is a Blackfoot teaching, which essentially means uh, to give empathy, to give compassion, especially to those who are suffering or to, to those who have potentially um, maybe done wrong. So it's about 
giving empathy over judgment. Um, and harm reduction is, is rooted, rooted in that principle of, of empathy and compassion, of having empathy for drug and alcohol users, of, uh, of having compassion um, for, for where they're at in their life. And so this film, I really hope, uh, compels audiences to, to see drug and alcohol users as human beings who deserve dignity and who deserve compassion and empathy. Um, and I think compassion and empathy, or Gim Mopi Bitsen, has been a guiding principle in, in um, our community's efforts, especially those who are on the front lines and, and the many leaders who are quietly working behind the scenes. Hello, Maya. More to uh, talk about with the doc and, and other things here. We just got to step aside for a quick break and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face with filmmaker Elamaya Tail Feathers. Stick around. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Elamaya Tail Feathers. And Elamaya, we've been talking about your new film, the, the documentary, uh, Guy Ma B. Pitson, The Meaning of Empathy. And, you know, you mentioned your mother's in the, the film as well. Did you, uh, I guess, what sort of responsibility did you feel to uh, your nation and, and the people that are in the film? Well, it was a huge undertaking to tell my community story and my family's story. I think as Indigenous filmmakers, we have an additional responsibility to be accountable to our community. Um, and it was also important for me to show that there's a diversity of lived experiences and diversity of opinions and, um, and voices within the community. And so in the film, we hear from over 50 community members from all different walks of life. And I really thought it was important for audiences to understand that, that this crisis is affecting absolutely everyone in the community and that everybody is is doing their part in one way or another. Um, and I'm so immensely proud of, of my community and it's a place that I love so very deeply and I wanted to be able to, to put all of that into the film so people can, can witness the strength and beauty of, of my community. Uh, in the film, you had pretty incredible access to a, a safe injection site, and as we know, we, you know they can be divisive uh, to the point that the Conservative government in Alberta closed the one that uh, you visited in Lethbridge. Uh, many governments won't support them. Uh, from what you were seeing, though, are, are, are they part of the solution? Absolutely. I don't think they are the solution. They're part of the solution, as, as you said. Um, the supervised consumption site in Lethbridge uh, was one of the busiest in the country and many of the people who used that site were from Kainai, were from my nation. And after the closure of that site, we have now witnessed such a, a grave impact on the community. Um, Lethbridge has now become, uh, Lethbridge now has one of the highest rates of death due to overdose or drug poisoning in and again, many of those people are from my community and many of them are Indigenous. Um, and so all of those deaths that have happened since the closure of that, of that site were preventable. Um, all of those people had families, had loved ones, had hopes and dreams and deserved to be treated with dignity and respect. Um, and they should be alive today and they would be alive today, likely if, if the supervised consumption site was open. And I think people need to understand that um, that harm reduction is, is a continuum, right? That there are very immediate forms of harm reduction, which is, which is saving lives through, through reversing overdose um, with naloxone or Narcan, but there are so many other forms of harm reduction um, and, and, and it's a continuum of care. And so the very initial um, aspect of harm reduction of saving lives is crucial because, uh, you know, many people say this, you can't, you can't give a person who is dead a second chance, mm -hmm. and so if we're saving if we're saving someone's life, um, that provides the opportunity for them to recover, and and it takes time, and relapse is, is a is a natural part of of recovery, and I think we need to understand that it's a very um, nuanced, complicated journey, and every single every single person's journey is going to look different. Behind the scenes, you worked with the uh, mainly Indigenous crew on this film. Uh, how important uh, is that for you? Uh, I think it's crucial in, in 
being an indigenous storyteller to to make sure that the people behind the camera are also indigenous. Uh, I did work with the settlers as well, and, and they were wonderful crew members, uh, team members. Um, but I think it absolutely influences the environment on set. Um, it absolutely influences the story when when those who are behind the camera are, are, are also indigenous. Um, and I think it's so critical that we're building capacity within the film industry um, in, in building opportunities for indigenous technicians, such as camera operators and, and sound recordists and, and people working in lighting and, and makeup and you know all of these different uh departments within within the film industry um because you know we've we've seen uh settlers get it wrong for over a hundred years in terms of representations of indigenous people um and everyone behind the camera has an influence on on what we're seeing in front of the camera so it's crucial that that in this journey towards narrative sovereignty and telling our own stories that um, we're also crewing our projects with, with Indigenous people. In my estimation, the last two years have been pretty remarkable for yourself. You were in Jeff Barnaby's Blood Quantum. You starred in, co-wrote, co-directed The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, which was widely acclaimed. You won Canadian Screen Awards and more. How would you describe the last few years for yourself? Uh, well, I've been working very hard for a long time, uh, and so it's yeah, it's it's been a real wild journey these last um, few years. But I would say there's there's 15 years of working towards this, and a lot of rejection and a lot of uh, learning along the way. But it's been an absolute honor to to work with with people like Jeff Barnaby and Dennis Goulet and. Um, and I have to absolutely credit the work of so many other indigenous filmmakers and people within the film industry, indigenous people within the film industry who have fought so hard to, to advocate for change, um, to advocate for narrative sovereignty and for indigenous filmmakers to have the opportunity to tell our stories and to have the resources necessary to, to tell the kind of stories that we want to tell. Um, so when we made The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, we, we entered um, into a, a really interesting moment in Canadian film and Indigenous film, wherein um, Canadian funding bodies were, were um, finally offering Indigenous filmmakers the opportunity to, to work with the types of resources or the, the financing that we needed to tell the kinds of stories we wanted to tell. Um, because prior to that, there's there's been a long history of inequity or lack of access to the same resources that that uh, settler filmmakers have have been provided for for decades, and so I think the body remembers when the world broke open, and, and films like Blood Quantum and Dennis Goulet's Night Raiders are are really reflective of of this moment that we're that we're witnessing within Indigenous film, and I'm just really excited about the road ahead because there's so many incredible feature films that are that are on the horizon coming from other Indigenous filmmakers. We know it's an industry that treats women differently, obviously, and never mind uh, an Indigenous woman. Uh, did you, uh, what was, what's been your experience, I guess, in the, the film industry over those 15 years or so? Uh, well, I, I started as an actor. Uh, I went to Vancouver Film School for acting and um, acted professionally in film and TV for a couple of years after that, but grew incredibly jaded with the industry as an indigenous woman, as a racialized person, um, for all the obvious reasons. Um, so my my grandparents have always been huge proponents of post-secondary education. So my grandma just kept asking, you know, like, when are you going to go back to school and, and basically do something real? Uh, so I went to UBC and, and studied indigenous studies. Um, while I was there, I learned how to operate a camera and use editing software and made my first short film and having the opportunity to have narrative agency was um, was life-changing and so I've been making films now for for I guess 10 years um, and it's been quite the journey to to witness that that change um, I guess over 15 years now uh, Elmaya, more to uh, talk about. We do just have to step out for another quick break and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face with Elmaya Tailfeathers.
Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Elamaya Tailfeathers, who just released their, her latest documentary, Gima Bipitsin, The Meaning of Empathy, and in the last few years, as we were saying, has starred in Blood Quantum and co-wrote and co-directed the award-winning uh, The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, uh, among many other numerous award-winning uh, features and shorts. Uh, Elamai, I've seen you referred to uh, as an activist director in a number of articles. Uh, what do you make of that title? Uh, I'm quite uncomfortable with it, actually. Uh, I think I'm just telling stories that matter and um, I strive to make films that would make my grandparents proud and make my family proud um, and I think so many of us as Indigenous storytellers feel compelled or an obligation to to tell stories that make a difference or have a positive impact on our on our communities so I don't know I don't really feel comfortable with being called an activist um, I think I'm just telling stories that matter yeah, I think it was Tasha Hubbard who we had on earlier this year too and saying just uh, being an Indigenous filmmaker pretty much makes you an activist in some ways. Um, as you mentioned, you know, you went to school but then ended up going, you know, went to film school, ended up going back to school for First Nation studies and gender studies. Uh, things are never really a, a clear path to get to where you want to get to, but just wondering what advice you might have for those who want to get into the film industry, whether it's in front or behind the camera? Uh, well, we always need more people in this industry, um, especially working in the key technical positions. You know, we don't have enough uh, cinematographers and sound recordists and, and lighting technicians, you know, all of those key technical departments. Um, so I would just encourage anybody who wants to get into film to, to please do so, to go to school if you need to go to school. Um, to reach out to community and to be brave and to be kind. Um, I think I, there's a beautiful, thriving Indigenous film industry that I'm really, really proud to be a part of. Um, and, and we always could use more. Uh, you've always seemed to have a number of projects on the go. Uh, what's coming up next for you? Uh, well, I am working on my next narrative feature. It's, a, it's an adaptation of a, of a short story by an Indigenous Australian author named Ellen Van Nierven. Uh, and it's a, it's a bit weird, uh, but so exciting. And, and I'm really excited to, to tell a, a film that kind of forces me to step out of my comfort zone. It's like an environmental thriller and it's funny and a bit of a of it's scary and it's uh, it's a queer love story, so it's it's a lot of things, and uh, I'm I'm really excited to to be able to work on something new and, and challenging. Well, Elamaya, the the documentary is going to be premiering at Hot Docs. So we wish you all the best and success with that, and thank you so much for being with us this week. Yeah, thank you very much. Great to be here. And that is all the time we have for this week. You can catch up on any episodes you may have missed by visiting our website, aptnnews.ca. And you can also find all of these episodes as podcasts by visiting aptnnews.ca slash face-to-face podcast. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night. We'll see you back here next week.